The Venezuelan Vice President Tarek El Assaini said the helicopter had been found near the northern coast, around 45 kilometers from Caracas. The images he posted on social media appear to show it in a hillside clearing, surrounded by banana plants. But Mr. El Asami said there was no sign yet of the pilot. Oscar Perez standing in front of armed men in a video statement released Tuesday. Venezuelans, dear brothers, we do not speak for the state. We are a group of military officials, police and civilians in the search for balance and against this transitory criminal government. We do not belong to nor do we have a partisan political leaning. We are nationalists, patriots, institutionalists. This combat is not with the rest of the security forces of the state. It is against the imposed impunity of this government. Oscar Lopez, a policeman and part-time actor. The government has condemned the incident as an act of terrorism. Saying this was part of an attempted coup encouraged by the US. His officials claim the stolen helicopter fired 15 shots at the Interior Ministry. Then it flew to the nearby Supreme Court, which was in session, and attacked it with four grenades. It's not clear how many detonated. There are no reports of injuries. The government says this was done by police pilot Oscar Perez. Images appeared on social media that seemed to show Perez in a police chopper waving a banner bearing the word liberty. There's also a video showing him in front of several hooded armed men saying an operation has begun to restore democracy. However, there are suspicions, especially among Maduro's opponents, that this drama was staged. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro has called Tuesday's attack terrorism and an attempted coup and has activated the armed forces. The attack came shortly after clashes broke out between opposition lawmakers and Venezuelan National Guardsmen. The Venezuelan Supreme Court has been the target of fierce criticism from the right-wing opposition after recent Recent rulings ended parliamentary immunity and granted the judiciary temporary legislative powers, though the court later annulled both rulings. Tuesday's attack comes amidst three months of violent protests. And the visual on it this week was just incredible. On Wednesday, a police officer in Venezuela's investigative police force allegedly commandeered a helicopter that attacked both the Supreme Court and the Interior Ministry. Um, the assault allegedly by Oscar Perez was made, he said, in the name of democracy, in his words, against a criminal government. Others said no, this was just a staged attack by the Maduro government to draw attention um, that it was really done by the, you know, by the anti-Maduro forces. All of this comes against a backdrop of an ongoing anti-government protest and essentially hunger and starvation because of economic downward spiraling, lack of food in the grocery stores, 80 people dead in these anti-government protests since April. Nancy, bring us up to date. Well, as you said, the images were so dramatic, and I'd like to point out that one of the cards that was being like, carried on the helicopter read Article 350, which refers to the article in the Constitution that says that the public essentially has a responsibility to rise up should it see um, ill practices by its government. I think it's interesting that this comes ahead of what the president has asked for, a July 30 vote that would create sort of a super body that would essentially give him um, powers to rewrite the Constitution and other powers over institutions in the country, this effort to sort of argue by, by Maduro that if I have more power, then I can bring more control, and it's just not um, being embraced by the opposition, which is asking for general elections, and as has as, as been pointed out, real reforms in its country. All the while, the oil prices don't show any hope of rising in a way that would somehow allow Venezuela to be able to better subsidize um, its food staples as it did um, up until this crisis and, and now struggles to do. Well, Nancy mentions oil, James, and of course that has been the cash cow of the Venezuelan state. Essentially, it has functioned as a petro state. Um, you know, when I spent I spent uh, three years going in and out of Venezuela as a correspondent um, based in Bogota, Colombia, and I swear to you, the bottled water was more expensive than the gasoline. True story. Um, 
this is under Hugo Chavez, um, and the gasoline was so cheap there, so plentiful, and it really propped up his government and allowed him to put out all these social programs um, that made him extremely popular. Now his successor, Nicolas Maduro, has not been able to keep up the same level of government spending because of the crash in the oil prices. So what has Maduro's response been to this attack with the helicopter, for example? I mean, he's claimed it's a coup. Right, and, and this is why a lot of people are suspicious of it, because it, it fits very comfortably into his narrative that there is a coup underway and that it's funded by the United States and, and, and various other neighbors that he is are calling out to blame for his problems. Um, it, if it was a coup, it was a, it was a very poorly planned one. You don't really launch many coups of one helicopter and a, and a guy who's a <laughs> sort of an interesting character. He's an actor, he's a special forces pilot. Um, it's, it's very suspicious and plays into Maduro's narrative, but the real issue to watch is, is this constitution rewriting. If he's allowed to do that, um, a lot of people are afraid that Venezuela is a, a, a failed state, basically. Wow. Really, the question of whether in some way all of this latest chaos, particularly with the helicopter, was potentially staged by President Maduro to foment a sense of urgency in, you know, circling the wagons of his supporters, or the support of his party at least because I think it's fair to say that the people who supported Hugo Chavez with a lot of passion and fervor don't support Maduro with quite the same passion and fervor um, you know to, to back him up against the opposition is there any validity to that argument and it certainly looked staged to me and if you if you take a step back and you look at what's been happening in Venezuela in recent years this is most likely another step in Nicolas Maduro's gradual extinction of democracy in Venezuela. With the jailing of political prisoners, uh, with the curtailment of democratic rights, and now this, this new idea of a constituent assembly that would, for all intents and purposes, cancel the presidential elections uh, for next year, which if they were free and fair, President Maduro would lose. You know, Indira, you, you mentioned that Venezuela is a petro state. I think it's also accurate at this point to call Venezuela and this government in particular an arco state. Mm -hmm. Everybody talks about oil, but the commodity that really matters these days in Venezuela is cocaine. Um, the vice president, uh, Tariq El Aysami, uh, has been accused by the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency of drug trafficking. He denies it. Um, but it also explains part of the power dynamic because there's lots of people who look at Venezuela and sort of wish that the, the military would step in and get rid of uh, Maduro. But at the same time, if you create that power vacuum, you also create the possibility that the military or the group of generals currently in charge will lose power. And if they do, what awaits them is not just a jail cell, but potentially a jail cell in the United States, which is their greatest fear and explains one of the reasons for this impasse that we've been facing over the last few years. You point something very interesting out, and, and that is how co contemporaneous with the decline, or at least the, the Colombian government's efforts to fight cocaine trafficking, particularly under the government of Alvaro Uribe in the early 2000s, you saw this corresponding rise in cocaine trafficking in Venezuela in the early 2000s, and the complaints that the DEA in the United States made against the Venezuelan authorities date back to the early 2000s. These are not new complaints. They have been, you know, basically putting, you know, constraints on our relationship with uh, Venezuela and our cooperation with Venezuelan drug authorities, saying that there are criminal elements um, within the government that have to do with narco-trafficking. So, you know, you make a good point, and I wonder, can you tell us, the humanitarian conditions in the country have been terrible. Um, it's not just been this year, um, but it's got a lot of attention this year. So what does the outlook um, look like now? There's been a lack of proper medicine, food shortages. Do you see any constructive end in sight when there's so much civil unrest? Maduro does hold so much power. And as you say, he seems to be trying to extinguish democracy. Well, you have a terrible humanitarian crisis, as you point out, that I think deserves everyone's attention. You also have a political crisis where after 80 days of more or less constant protests in Venezuela, at least 76 people, mostly students, um, have been killed. As far as the outlook, Gosh, you know, people hate it when I say this, but I think Maduro is winning right now. I think he is on his way towards consolidating power and again, uh, snuffing out that last little flicker of Venezuelan democracy because he has, for the most part, a monopoly of force. And the opposition remains somewhat divided, which is understandable because they're essentially living in a police state. Where you have the uh, one of the main opposition leaders, Leopoldo Lopez, who's been jailed on completely trumped up charges for for a long time now. So I, I, my concern is that you know, for all you know, some of the goodwill and the expressions of support that have come uh, from elsewhere in the region, 
uh, that, that Maduro may actually succeed in hanging on to power for a very long time. And it is incredible that all of this is happening in a country that is in northern South America, literally on our you know southern doorstep, and a country that I don't know if this is current, but that was for many years the fourth biggest supplier of oil to the United States. And, and can I just mention that, um, you know, you talked about uh, reporting from Latin America as a, a region where it doesn't get a lot of attention from America. I mean, now's a time when it's crying out for leadership from America, and it's just not there. I mean, we were seeing a potential failed state happen. There's already a migration crisis. All kinds of ways this can affect us in a very negative way, and yet I don't see anything that we're doing to try to rally the region to, to deal with this problem. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, let's get some analysis now from Mariana Zunia, who is a freelance journalist based in Caracas. First of all, what can she tell us about the attack? Police helicopter attacked the Supreme Court yesterday around 5 p.m. The helicopter carried a sign that read 350 and freedom. 350 is the, is the article within Venezuela's constitution that calls for civil uh, disobedience if the government represents some kind of danger for democracy. A man inside the helicopter allegedly tossed four grenades and shot 50 times. And the newest information that we have at this moment is that all flights, commercial and private, were prohibited inside the Venezuelan airspace. Right, now there's this reporting that the, the, the ringleader of the attack was uh, this uh, policeman or special forces guy, Oscar Perez. How certain is that information? It is very certain. On state TV, President Maduro said that special forces were after the terrorists behind the attack. He said, and also other ministers said that the, the helicopter was stolen and identified the pilot as Oscar Perez, part of the military special forces. He is also known for being the actor and producer of an action film called Muerte Suspendida in Spanish, or Suspended Death, where he and other members of the military forces acted in 2015. Right, so is, is he a sort of national name? Is he very well known? Uh, to be honest, it's the first time I, I've heard about him. Uh, apparently, he, he's, very, he's well known in, in the social media, and he was known by this film. But as a journalist and as a Venezuela, this is the first time I hear his name. Right, and how have people reacted to this? Tell us about that. Well, uh, there were some speculation, uh, especially it spread widely on social media, that the helicopter attack could have been some kind of show or stage to cover two other events that were taking place at the same time. For example, while the helicopter were, was on the air at the National Assembly, two dozen lawmakers couldn't leave the building for around four hours since pro-government paramilitary groups were surrounding the building and they were threatening the lawmakers. Also, the Supreme Court removed powers from the public prosecutor, Luis Ortega Diaz. She has been one of the most critical voices uh, against the ruling party during these almost three months of process. So that's why many state people think that this could have been some kind of show staged by the government. This happens because in Venezuela there are not many uh, media and uh, the, the freedom of, of speech is in question all the time. So many rumors spread always uh, through social media and, uh, and apps like WhatsApp or that, this kind of places. So what you're really saying is we've just seen another example of how deep the divisions in Venezuela are. Yeah, exactly. Also, I think it is important to say that Perez declared, when, before going inside of the, of the helicopter, Perez declared himself in rebellion against Maduro. He also said on a video shared on his Instagram account that he represented a coalition of military officials opposed to the government. However, it doesn't appear to be a threat since one of Venezuela's top military observers said yesterday that rumors of a military uprising were false. Anyway, we saw many militaries around the, the presidential palace last night, and probably we're going to find the city, Caracas, pretty militarized this morning as well. It doesn't make any sense. It's a joke. How many people have been detained here just for raising a flag? and then for some guy to take a helicopter. They'd kill him the moment he lands. That's the truth with how things are. This looks more like a governmental tactic than anything else. 
I don't like thinking like this, but that's the way it is. Meanwhile, a Venezuelan police officer who led a helicopter attack last week on the country's interior ministry and Supreme Court released a new video Wednesday vowing a second wave of attacks. Oscar Pettis apparently recorded the video from behind after abandoning his helicopter during his escape. There are 30 million Venezuelans that go with truth, and they will have to imprison the entire country in order to silence our mission, our duty, our patriotism, our fight. We will go to the street, and we will be there with you. You are not alone. Most people in the street and on social media have expressed their doubts about the incident and the, the sense that this is a, a sort of a red herring uh, hoax by the government, a ruse. But there is the possibility that it's not a, a foreign order conspiracy, but a part of the growing rift within the government and within the status quo, which has this expression in this officer, in this rogue pilot, uh, so to speak. We don't know who is supporting him, we don't know if it's a lone wolf, but the point is that this extraordinary event occurred yesterday, and even though the government tried to uh, use it in order to crank down upon the opposition, it sort of backfired if that was the idea. It showed him weak and, and, and feeble in, in the face of this event. And, uh, an helicopter uh, crossing around half town Caracas with no opposition, with no defense, not taking, not being taken down. It's a very surprising event. There's still a lot of confusion about you know whether this was a genuine attack by this police officer and part-time actor Oscar Perez angry at the government or whether it was staged by the government but I guess if, if people believe the latter it's symptomatic of how little people trust this government now. Yes, the government has played a cool car since 2002. By then it was a well-founded car in fact we had a, a, a coup attempt in 2002 which was semi-successful uh, against the Chavista movement and the Chavez government uh, in, during that year. But uh, since then, the government has denounced and announced uh, investigations, plots, and, and, and many attempts against the life of the president and against the status quo, and they've, they've come to naught. Nothing like that has happened. So people are, are growing weary and cynical of that plot. We have an election though next month, so this is the chance for Venezuelans to have their say and get a new administration in if they want to, surely. Well, it's not a regular election of any sort. It's a sort of a simulacrum of an election. Both the electorate and the nomination process have been rigidly controlled by the government. Venezuela's Supreme Court has banned the Attorney General from leaving the country and has frozen all her assets. The court, which is dominated by government loyalists, said Luisa Ortega Diaz, had committed serious errors. She broke ranks in March when she said an attempt by the Supreme Court to strip the opposition-controlled Congress of its powers was unlawful. I'm just looking at one of the uh, newspapers in Venezuela, and in the best side, it said the opposition has called for a march on the Supreme uh, Court. There's been international condemnation of an attack by a group of government supporters on the opposition-controlled National Assembly in Venezuela. Dozens of supporters of President Nicolas Maduro stormed the National Assembly Wednesday, attacking opposition lawmakers with rock sticks and firecrackers. Video from the chaotic scene showed two members of the Assembly with blood running down their faces. At least seven lawmakers were reportedly injured. Among them was Armando Armas. Despite a nasty head wound, he was defiant. Nearly 100 youths have died in the protests, so a few blows from these thugs is nothing. There was blood all over the white walls of the legislature, and the entire Congress was besieged for something like eight hours. The attackers brandishing sticks had burst into the building during a special session to mark the country's Independence Day and beat up several Congress members. <laughs> The confrontation which happened during a session to mark the country's independence day turned violent. That's right. I mean, a few dozen pro-government militiamen basically busted into the very stately Congress and began slaying the middle <laughs> 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 
legs chained in all directions. And the violent scuffles as government supporters burst into Venezuela's opposition-controlled National Assembly. Oh, well, they certainly were in support of the government. Um, you know, the, the National Guard that is set up outside of the Congress, you know, should have stopped them. And I would point out that the National Guard has been very quick to repress any protests against uh, President, President Maduro. So the fact that they didn't act to stop there, there was a lot of questions about whether this was in, in somehow, some way coordinated between the government and these militias. And the United States is one of the number of countries to express its condemnation. The United States said it was an assault on democratic principles. What happened yesterday really is an alarm. I think it really uh, is, it should be a concern for a lot of people because it shows just the degree to which, you know, passions are being ignited right now in Venezuela. Well, this is just the latest stage in a political crisis marked by numerous anti-government demonstrations. At least 90 people have died during weeks of political turmoil. And widespread anger over what many see as the authoritarian rule of President Nicolas Maduro. As opposition protesters hoping to topple President Maduro have set up checkpoints, staged massive protests and assassinated a judge who jailed an opposition leader. Speaking at a military parade celebrating the anniversary of Venezuela's independence, President Maduro condemned the violence. At the door and in some of the gardens and hallways of the National Assembly, there were incidents of unrest and violence. I absolutely condemn these acts. President Maduro condemned the violence, but it was the second time this year that pro-government gangs have attacked Congress, the only branch of power controlled by the opposition. Lawmaker Jose Correa said it was a terrible example to set on Independence Day. Besides the lawmakers, he said, Venezuela's democracy was also wounded. Around Maduro's plans to rewrite the Constitution. Venezuela's Roman Catholic Church has criticized President Nicolas Maduro's decision to rewrite the Constitution, saying the plan will turn the country into a military dictatorship. The head of the Venezuelan Episcopal Conference, Diego Padron, said the reforms would be imposed by force. If every, you know, everyone on both sides is basically seeing us in the final stages of some battle to end all battles, for Maduro, this Constitutional Assembly is basically the dike between civil war and peace. And for the opposition, if, if the Constitutional Assembly is allowed to go through, they say, they say it could spell the end of Venezuela's democracy as we know it. The situation made even worse by the country's dire economic problems. Quite dramatic and uh, uh, quite unbelievable scenes in the National Assembly yesterday. Indeed, my, my friends, my journalists, my colleagues were all inside the building when it was attacked. I know uh, one of the lawmakers assaulted, Americo de Gracia, he's 58 and he was badly beat up. Like the US, like the State Department said, this is unacceptable, even for Venezuela, even for such a violent country as this. I'm 47, it's the first time I see anything like this happen. And just to explain to people, there were a handful of uh, mainly opposition MPs who were, and when we say attacked, I mean there was blood oozing from a number of them from their skulls, they then they had were, to be taken they were to... They were violently attacked. They are what we call the supermajority, 112 uh, opposition lawmakers, which dominate the, the assembly. The government lost the assembly by a landslide in 2015. They were assaulted by uh, about 200 government supporters. The National Guard allowed the government supporters inside the, the ground. And they were armed. Yes. And it wasn't easy to get in by, by any chance because it's a massive door and you see a lot of them from people who are able to look at the video if they go online they can see uh, even on our BBC pages these uh, militias as they attacked with some of them were armed with it looked like pipes some even with stones what exactly were they pipe, demanding pipe. When, they, when they got in there what were they saying to these opposition MPs it was an intimidation they were not making any demands it was just an intimidation attack they told the lawmakers that with the new constitution they will be forced out of the building. 
It was just a terror attack. There was there was no concrete demand made. And tell us, what is the government doing? Because these were reportedly, allegedly, so mainly supporters of the president, Nicolas Maduro, who was elsewhere at the time. It was supposed to be Independence Day. What has he was, said? What has he said about what has happened and what might now happen to these people who attacked the the parliamentarians? The president wasn't far away from the building. The line all of a sudden seems to have dropped. Uh, are you there, uh, Carlos? Are you still there with us? Unfortunately, uh, Carlos Camacho has dropped uh, from the line from Caracas. Uh, today, Thursday, to express what it calls its rejection against the dictatorship in Venezuela.